what's the catch? <clears throat> right? How many times have you said that? What's, what's the catch? I mean, we have unfortunately been burned so many times. We've learned that when something seems too good to be true, it probably is, right? I mean, we just know that inherently. And we struggle with the idea of getting something for nothing. I mean, on the one hand, there are those of us who still are naive and gullible enough. We really like the idea of getting something for nothing. It's very appealing. Uh, and that's why there are still so many timeshares sold in America. But on the other hand, we've learned the hard way uh, what Mr. Smith tried to teach me back in the eighth grade. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Right? No such thing as a free lunch. This is, I think, somewhat symptomatic of our skeptical human nature. But I also think it's a little bit uh, symptomatic of our, of our arrogant attitude. Right? That, that we can earn everything if we, if we work hard enough. Now, that's good, right? Because that mindset makes us work hard for the things that we want. We can develop a good work ethic. But the bad side of that is it makes it really hard for us then to receive a genuine gift. You ever known somebody who was terrible at receiving gifts? I'll let you in on a few secrets. I'm no expert. I'm, I'm pretty horrible myself. But here's a, here's a few things that I've learned. A real gift isn't based on what you deserve. Another thing, you can't pay someone back for a gift. People don't give you a gift thinking, well, I want to give them something really nice because then they'll give me something really nice back. When someone gives you a gift card, they don't want you to use it to buy something for them. And when someone, when you're having a family crisis and someone brings you a, a, a casserole dish, right, full of a delicious meal, they expect you to return it back empty, not full. Maybe you didn't know that. We can be really terrible at receiving gifts. So when we come to a verse like Romans 3.24 that we talked about last week, that we are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, we naturally think, what's the catch? Right? It can't be that easy. Maybe Lord, maybe we can go halvesies on this, right? I've, I've done some good things, and, and I can meet you halfway. Uh, and, and maybe I can work really hard to pay you back for the rest. Here's what I hope we can learn today as we wrap up this portion of Romans. The only way to be made right with God is to stop trying. Stop trying. That is... Oh, it's so hard for us to wrap our tiny little brains around. It's so contrary to our nature. But uh, what we read in Scripture is that all we have to do, in fact, all we can do is believe it. And that's what Paul tried to explain in the last part of Romans 3 and going into chapter 4. So as we wrap up this first section of Romans, we really, really want to drill down and make sure we understand the theme of this section, and that is justification by faith. Justification by faith. So before we move into today's passage, I want to do a, a quick review and make sure we understand, first of all, what justification is. Second, why we need justification. And then third, we'll, we'll do a, a quick move through. There's a lot of verses here. But we're going to move quickly through uh, Romans 3.27 to the end of chapter 4 to make sure we're clear on how we get justification. How we get justification, which will confirm for us just how desperately we need the gospel. And that's what we've been talking about this whole time, right? So the first question, what is justification? And I'm hoping that, um, that maybe the kids will uh, help me out with this a little bit. Because justification, uh, why don't you guys come on over if you don't mind. 
Are your kids awake back there? Or did they leave? Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Um, yeah, justification is one of those big, fat, churchy words, right? That, but it's important for us to understand it is so, so, so important to our faith. So uh, maybe you can help us understand this big, fat, churchy word. Justification is the act of being made right with God. Does that make sense? It's, a, it's, a, it's an action. It's not a process. What's that? You think you know what's happening now? You just wait for it. You'll see. Um, it's, it's, um, in its original language um, that Paul wrote in, it has the same root word as righteousness. Have you heard, you've heard of the word righteousness, right? What do you think of when you hear the word righteousness? What's that? Perseverance, okay. What's that? Faithfulness, okay. Um, we might think of, of, of being really good or, or, or holy. Really, and ultimately what righteousness means is in right standing with God, right? We are in right standing with God. It was a legal term, kind of from the courtroom. Like when the judge drops his gavel, you've probably seen this on TV, and says, not guilty, right? Right, well, he says that too, right? Uh, maybe more than we need him to, or more than we think we need him to. No, but when, he, when the judge says not guilty, that's the same thing in God's terms of what justification is. He's saying we are not guilty for our sins. Not only that, but also he's saying we are righteous, which, which can mean like uh, really, really good, not, uh, completely without sin, right? So that doesn't work very well, right? Because we're not, right? We, we do wrong things. We, we sin a lot. And, um, and so this legal term, when God declares us not guilty, all of our sins, past, present, future, are forgiven in that moment, right then. Like, it's not like, okay, wait and see, and we'll figure it out, right? When, we, when, when that happens, that justification, we are, uh, our sin is taken away, and we are declared righteous. And, and, and that's entirely God's work, right? It's not anything that we do. We don't, like, try to act really good and try really hard not to do the wrong things that we've done. I mean, we do do that, but that's a separate story. Like, the, that doesn't get us right with him because we can never be good enough. Is that right? Does that sound right so far? Um, so this is his work. And he makes this really, in human terms, it's a really strange exchange with us. Like what we have is sin. Like this giant, giant pack of sin on our back. And, and he takes that away from us, all of that sin. And what he gives us in exchange doesn't seem like a real fair trade. He gives us what's known as the righteousness of Jesus. So Jesus is the only person who ever lived a perfect life, right? So he takes off from us our sin and he puts onto us Jesus' righteousness so that when he looks at us, he sees Jesus' righteousness, right? And that's how we can have right standing. That's how we can be with him because we don't have that sin anymore. He took it away from us and he gave us Jesus' righteousness. Uh, and it's something only he can do to make us acceptable to him. And the great thing about it is it happens instantaneously. You know what that means? What? Instantaneously, like immediately. Immediately, right? It's, it's kind of like um, an ice cube, right? When it melts, here, I'm going to give you one of those. Hold it, and, and I want you to watch and see if you, can, if you can see the moment when it's turning from ice into water. Do you see it? All I see is one second it's ice, and the next second it's water. Right? I don't see an in-between phase in there, do you? No. 
And that's what justification is like. When we trust in Jesus, instantly, all our sin is gone. All the sin we ever did, all the sin we're doing, all the sin we ever will do is taken away. It's forgiven. Right? Oh, well, you could do that too, if you would like to, but uh, that's not in my plan today. Um, and, and if you don't want to hold it anymore, you can put it back in the, in the thing there. So it's, it's instantaneous. One second, we are guilty. We are unrighteous. We are dead in our sins. And then, blam, just like that, we are now not guilty. We are righteous. We are alive. That's something only God can do. Like uh, an ice molecule turning into water. There's no in-between stage there. And this can be confusing for us because as Christians, we keep on sinning sometimes, don't we? Mm -hmm. You know Christians who still sin, right? Maybe mom or dad, Maybe, definitely, Pastor Steve. Maybe, right, you, right? And so when we do that, we think, well, am I justified or not? Am I saved? Did, did God really save me? Well, yeah. We're working that part of it out, right? But that sin, even as we do it, is already forgiven, right? So you don't have to feel guilty about it. Like, we, we use that uh, as, a, as, an, as an opportunity to change, Right? Those sins are already forgiven because in God's eyes, we are not guilty. So here's how I want you to remember this big, fat, churchy word, right? So we have the word justified. You can think of it, this is a little oversimplified, but just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's how God... Yeah, sure. So that's the way God sees us once we put our trust in him, just as if... I'd never sinned. Pretty cool, huh? Right. All right. You guys can go ahead. Thank you for helping me. Uh, I hope that that was helpful to them and uh, and not too tra traumatizing for you. Um, so that's the that's what what is justification? Next, we're going to look at the why, right? And and we've been doing that for for several weeks. We've been looking at why do we need justification, right? Paul spent the better better part of three chapters making this clear. It boils down to sin, right? If you were listening to Pastor Chris last week, you heard him talk about this verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? But what is sin? What do you think? What is sin? Okay. What's that? Disobedience, sure. Missing the mark. Yeah, we often think of it, uh, and, and I've heard... Um, uh, a pastor preaching on this where he, he had uh, asked uh, a man who was just new to the faith or, or coming into faith, like, what is sin? He's like, well, I guess it's the, the wrong things I've done to, uh, to, to other people, right? And he's like, okay, who else? Um, maybe, um, I guess, my, my, to my family, yes, and... Uh, it, to myself, right? Yes, and he never got to the part where the most important part of sin, which is the things we've done wrong toward God. And ultimately, it is rebellion against God, right? We, we learned about that back in chapter one, that, that God's glory was right there for us to know, and we refused to acknowledge his glory and surrender to his sovereignty. And that's the ultimate sin. All the other are fringe benefits, not fringe benefits, fringe unbenefits, right? We hurt other people. We hurt our family. We hurt our friends. We hurt people we don't even know. We hurt sometimes ourselves when we sin. But ultimately, like David said, against you and you only have I sinned, Lord 
So rebellion against God, this refusal to acknowledge his glory, refusal to surrender to his supremacy, to refusal to obey his will. And because of this, our relationship with God is destroyed, right? Not just hurt, not just wounded, not just scraped up a little bit. It is destroyed. And we think of that in terms of, of going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve, they had this perfect, perfect relationship with God. They walked with him. They talked with him. They, 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 they wandered around the garden with him. They had fellowship with him. And they allowed sin in, and that relationship was ruined, right? Ruined. Our relationship with God is destroyed. We have no right standing before him. And we stand as de deserving recipients, according to Romans 1.18, of God's wrath. We're helpless before him. Our deepest need is to be made right with him. And we have no way to get there. And so we spent a few weeks exploring the fact that yeah, we all knew this, right? Evil people need to be made right with God. But then we went further and said, hey, guess what? Good people also need to be made right with God. Even religious people, even Christians, people who've grown up in church need to be made right with God. We are all in the same boat. All our human attempts to be made right with God fall short and leave us in desperate need of the gospel. So that brings us up to this last part. How? How do we get justification? This thing that we so desperately need, every single one of us. And last week we covered what, as Pastor Chris noted, could has been called by many, the most important passage in the whole Bible. And it was talking about how this mess that we've made of our relationship with God has already been fixed by God because he appeased his own wrath, right? That propitiation, another big fat churchy word. He appeased his own wrath and he made the way for us to be right with him through the work that Jesus did on our behalf. Verse 26 said, It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of who? The one who has faith in Jesus. The one who has faith in Jesus. And because we can be a little dense at times, okay, you can say it, a lot dense at times, Paul went on to make sure we understand exactly what that means. That, that, that this faith that he talks about is exactly the only way for us to be made right with God. And this was a big emphasis uh, through the time you've heard of called the Reformation, right? Because in the observation of Luther and some of the other reformers was that the Roman Catholic Church at that time had adopted an attitude of faith and or faith, but. Like, yes, you're saved, but you have to live a certain way. Or, yes, salvation is by grace, and you have to do these certain things to gain God's favor. Uh, probably an oversimplification, but you get the idea. That's why one of the key messages that came screaming out of the Reformation was a Latin phrase called sola fide. Sola fide, by faith alone. There are no ifs, ands, or buts connected to faith. It's just faith and only faith. Faith, the whole faith, and nothing but the faith. Paul then enters into a, one of his imaginary conversations again and says uh, in verse 27, Then what becomes of boasting? He knows us so well. He so understands human nature. Well, what about me? Right? I mean, what about all this work I've done trying to keep the law? I've not been perfect, but surely I've made some kind of a contribution to my being made right with God. Surely all that wasn't wasted. Paul knew how desperate the human heart is to boast. 
and he squashes all hope. He says, it's excluded. Excluded. That means zero, right? Excluded. Boasting is excluded. There is no place for pride when it comes to being justified with God. He goes on to say, by, by what law then? What kind of law? Is it a law of works? No. By the law of faith. The Jews had misunderstood the purpose of the law, that, that somehow it put them above the Gentiles, that in receiving it and obeying it, they could be shown right with God. Paul flips the script and says, hey, we're not under a law of works. We're under a law of faith. He goes on, verse 28. Then what becomes of boasting? He says, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. We hold that one is justified by by faith, apart from works of the law. Was Paul throwing the law out the window? Absolutely not. He was trying to help them understand the true purpose of the law. Verse 29, or is God God of the Jews only? Is he not God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one, right? Right? God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by the same faith. If justification was earned through keeping the law, then it would be restricted to only the Jews because they're the ones that were given the law. But we've already established that God is God of both Jews and Gentiles. And to emphasize this point, Paul brought up one of the central tenets of the Jewish faith, right? From, from Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And if there's only one God, then the same God is God of both Jews and Gentiles. And there can only be one way to be justified with him or made right with him for both Jews and Gentiles, for circumcised and uncircumcised. And that way, Paul says, is faith. Faith, trusting God to keep his promises. And he says, verse 31, he wraps up chapter 3 saying, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Did God change the rules on us? Are we throwing the law out the window? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. This is what the law was all about. This was God's intention all along. This is what Jesus meant when he said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. The law demonstrated once and for all that it's impossible for humans to make themselves right with God. And so we have nothing to bring to the table. We have to rely on faith. Nothing but faith. So in chapter 4, then, Paul emphasized what faith is by contrasting it with what it is not, using good old Father Abraham as his example. And why Abraham? Well, this was the man the Jews, all the Jews revered, and they looked to as the founder of their faith family, the beginning of the entire Jewish race. Surely if anyone in the history of mankind was justified before God, it would be Abraham. So Paul grabbed hold of a truth from Abraham's life that, that he hoped would help flip the world upside down for those who thought that they could participate in their justification that somehow they could earn it, or at least earn part of it. And this, this truth was originally found in Genesis 15, 6, but it's quoted here in Romans 4, 3. Abraham believed, that's faith, right? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And guess what that is? Justification, right? Abraham had faith, and it was counted to him as justification was given righteousness. Now, you're going to have to spend some time on your own with Romans 4. I don't have time. I'm not going to take time uh, <laughs> to get everything it has to offer. There's so much there, but I'm going to hit some high points. 
right? We're going to talk about what faith is not. First thing, faith is not works. We've heard that before a couple of times, right? The first eight verses, Paul talks about that. He pointed out in verse 2, if Abraham was justified by works, then he would have a reason to boast, right? If, if he was justified by his works, then he would be able to boast. Why? Because verse 4, one, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due, right? When we work for something, we don't see it as a gift. We see it as what we earn. How many of you go to your boss on payday and say, Oh my goodness, you gave me a paycheck for, for the hours I worked. That is so generous of you. We don't do that, do we? We might grumble and complain about how small it is or how many taxes were taken out of it. But we expect to be paid for our work, right? We earned it. So if someone works for something and they receive what they've earned, that's just the way things work, right? We're used to that. But what about the one who doesn't work? That's verse 5. To the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one, this, this verse is so crucial in understanding justification by faith alone. To the one who does not work. Doesn't say the one who, who cooperates, the one who, who, who doesn't do as much negative. The one who does not work, but instead believes, there's that word again, believes in him who justifies who? The ungodly. Right? In our, in our prideful human nature, we want to think, well, if I get good enough, then, then God will be ready to receive me, right? And yeah, he does the rest of the work, but, but I have to be really good to get there. How many times have you heard people say, well, I'll come to church when I can get my life cleaned up a little bit, when I can get some things straightened out? No! God justifies the ungodly. Right? The, the ice cube turns it into water in that instantaneous moment. To the one who does not work but believes in him who, who the ungodly justifies, his faith is counted or, or credited to his account as righteousness. It's like a, a transaction, right? It's just like, Boop, there it is. Boop, there it is. Right? It just goes there. You don't see it happening. His faith is counted to him as righteousness. What he's saying is, Abraham falls in the second category. It doesn't say Abraham worked hard, or Abraham obeyed God, or Abraham was a really, really good man. No, he was. And God gave him what he earned. No, it says Abraham believed God and it was counted as a gift to him as righteousness. Paul goes on then to, to, you ever heard of somebody who likes to name drop? He's like, oh yeah, well, we talked about Abraham. Let's talk about David for a second. David wrote in Psalm 32, uh, he talked about the blessings uh, of righteousness that does not come from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So faith is not works. Not something we earn. He throws in there, uh, it is not circumcision. This is important again to the Jews, right? Verses 9 through 12, he talks about that. He brings circumcision back into play. Uh, for reasons that we've already talked about, we know that that wasn't that that was important to the Jews, that they saw it as a, something that set them apart or separated them, made them God's special people. It was a sign of their covenant with God. Verse 9 says, Is this blessing, and what he's saying there, this blessing is being credited with righteousness. Is this blessing 
then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised. And then Paul goes on to point out that, guess what? Genesis 15, 6, that verse he's been talking about, came before Abraham was circumcised. What? That can't be right. Whoops. Abraham's circumcision then came after as a sign and a seal of the righteousness that had already been credited to him, that he'd already been given by faith. A sign is something that's a, a symbol, a reminder. A, a, sim, a seal is a confirmation, right? An authentication, a guarantee. We like to think of baptism in those terms, right? It's a sign of what's happened. It's a seal of what the commitment I've made that I've put my faith in Jesus. And because of this, Abraham couldn't be the example because, because his righteousness, being credited with righteousness happened before circumcision, then Abraham can be the example now and the father of everyone who has faith, circumcised or uncircumcised, right? And we can follow in his footsteps of having faith and having righteousness credited to us. Also, faith is not keeping the law. We hit on that a little bit. But he says in verse 13, the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And he doesn't mention here, again, one of those whoops moments, the law didn't come until over 400 years after Abraham lived. But he does point out that if righteousness can be gained through the law, then we have no need for faith. And further that, we're nullifying God's promise. Anybody want to sign up for that? No? Okay, we won't put a sheet out for that. Verse 14, For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. Now, Paul's already established in in chapters 2 and 3, and we went through those, that it's impossible for anyone to be justified through the law because it's impossible for anyone to keep it, right? The result of the law, then, is not that we earn righteousness or, or, or some kind of a point system with God, but what we earn, according to uh, uh, verse 15 in chapter 2, is God's wrath, Right? Because he hates that for us. He hates for us to be separated from him. And he has to pour out his wrath on all rebellion. If we peek forward to Romans 6.23, we'll see that what we earn, right, the wages of sin is death. And so the law makes it clear that we fall short of God's glory, that we're in desperate need of being rescued by him. And so it all comes down to faith and grace. And that's in verse 16, if you're still following along there in chapter 4. Okay? And so the last thing that Paul mentions that faith is not is sight. And he comes back to Abraham, right? And he tags on an explanation of Abraham's faith, right? That, that verse 17, God had promised to Abraham back in Genesis 17, 5, I have made you a father of many nations. Pretty big promise, right? I have made you a father of many nations. Now, there was a problem with that, wasn't there? How many children did Abraham have at that time? Zero, right? No kids. And as the were in Paul's words, he was as good as dead in his body, right? Nearly a hundred years old. And his wife Sarah, who was no spring chicken herself, 10 years younger than Abraham, was barren. She'd been unable to bear any children for Abraham all these years. And still, Abraham believed. Right? Still, Abraham believed in verse 18, in hope, he believed against hope. 
There was no reason for him to believe that promise. It made no sense for him to believe that he would be the father of many nations, except God had promised it. God promised it. And despite what his eyes told him, and so despite what logic told him, and despite what science told him, he believed. Verse 20 and 21. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. He grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's faith, folks. That's faith, fully convinced that God is able to do what he's promised. And that, not works, not circumcision, not the law, is what was credited to Abraham as righteousness. But wait, there's more. Verse 23, not just for Abraham, but for all of us. Verse 24 and 25, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Raised so that we could be made right with God. That's what this whole first section of Romans has been about. Justification by faith. Why we need it <laughs> and how we get it. Faith, the whole faith, nothing but the faith. The only way to be made right with God is to stop trying. That's hard for us. That's hard for us. And there are people who, who've grown up in church and, and been in church their whole lives who still haven't quite got it. Still feel like, well, yeah, but I got to contribute something, right? I got to do something. There's got to be something I can do. Now, we'll go on to talk about the changed life that comes from this, right? But, but that's a separate issue, right? And that is a process. But justification is that moment, that instantaneous act. Imagine having uh, a huge mortgage. I, I know that's not probably too big of a, uh, a stretch for some of us, right? You're struggling to pay off your mortgage. You've lost your job. You've had some emergency expenses. You've burned through all your savings and the bank calls you and says, hey, guess what? You've missed too many payments and we're calling your loan due. And so you go in and you're like, uh, I, I, I don't have it. I, I can sell my car and, and I got some things around the house uh, that I can sell. I'll get Aaron to help me. And, and, and I can probably come up with about $10,000 that I can give you. But you owe us almost a half a million dollars. Well, I'm going to get a job soon, right? And, and then I can, I can make some extra payments, right? And, and, and help get it paid off. Your account is due today. So that doesn't help. Well, I think I have $20 in my wallet. I, oh, no, I gave that to my wife for lunch. Um, let me see what I've got in my pocket. I got a, a gum wrapper, expired bus pass, some lint. So what do you have for us? I have nothing. I have nothing. And imagine, great. That's what we were waiting for. We were just waiting for you to admit you have nothing to contribute toward your debt. And since you have nothing, we don't want to clear that debt. We want to give you your house free and clear. That's kind of what grace is like. It's a little crass, but you get the point. It's a gift from God that we didn't expect, that we didn't earn, and we can never repay. 
So if you're here this morning, if you're listening online and you've never, that's never made sense to you, you've never, you've never put your faith in God, you've never trusted him to keep his promise that he will make you right, what are you waiting for, right? There is no time like the present. We have no guarantee of anything beyond this morning, beyond this moment, right? If you've never taken that step, I want you to come talk to me or Pastor Chris or, or uh, one of our deacons, anybody really can help you to, to, to make that faith commitment, to trust God to keep his promise. If you have gotten caught up in the trap of, of trying to earn it, right? You received faith, uh, you received salvation a long time ago, but you've ever since then been trying to, to earn it, right? Been trying to do enough good things to, to, to make up for it, to pay God back somehow. I want you to let that go. Let it go. The only way to be made right with God is to stop trying. That doesn't mean we go out and sin as much as we can. That means we think about things in a whole different way. Or, if Satan's been lying to you, and I know he has, and if you decided to believe him, telling you you aren't worthy of justification because of X, Y, and Z that you've done or keep doing, you got to let that go too. Let it go. Don't receive Satan's accusation. Believe God's truth that when we have faith in him, that our faith is credited as righteousness, as right standing with him, as justification, as, as being given the privilege of having a right relationship with him. Music team, why don't you come up? The only way to be made right with God is to stop trying.